You want to rebuild a jet aeration motor, huh? Well, it's possible sometimes, but a lot of times you pull these out and they're simply done. They, they live a very rough life. They're down in a pit of water, humid, 24-7 for sometimes 15 years. So a lot of times when you pull these out, they're just simply done and you can't rebuild them. They're just too far gone. But sometimes you get lucky and they just had a part failure like the bearings went bad and you can pull them apart and, and, and fix them up. Before you rebuild one of these, you got to ask yourself, is it ethical? Is it economical? And the answer is probably not. The only reason I spend time rebuilding these is because I have a big pile of them and it's winter, so I don't really have a lot to do. So I can take a little bit of time or waste a little bit of my time taking these things apart. And generally I'm gonna find probably one out of three is actually rebuildable. And sometimes the uh, chances are of rebuilding them are higher, but I will accidentally break things on them because they are corroded. So I, it, it happens. You'll break a tab off, you'll break a, a boss off where a screw goes in, and then you've just created an, another spare parts motor. So you gotta, you gotta think about things like that. When it comes to ethics, when you spend a lot of your time rebuilding one of these motors, can you put any kind of warranty or guarantee on it? Probably not. It probably wouldn't be a good idea. You would simply have to sell these as being a rebuilt motor. And a lot of people aren't going to want that. And if they do, they're going to want to offer you the lowest price possible, where it's really not even worth your time. So that's, that's your ethical decision if you want to try to rebuild these and sell them. But also with ethics, some people, they need to have a jet-branded aeration motor because of legal reasons. So a lot of companies out there, they, they do offer alternative motors for these systems. And for the most part, that's fine. But if you happen to be in a jurisdiction where someone from the local authority having jurisdiction is actually checking your systems, they may have an issue with you putting in someone else's branded aerator motor into an aeration system because the jet system is certified by the National Sanitation Foundation to use jet branded parts. So if you start mixing other brands of parts in there, it would no longer meet the NSF certification for that system. And it could end up in the courtroom. It's unlikely. I mean, around here, that kind of thing is not checked or enforced. So that's another ethical thing. So maybe it would make sense to rebuild some simply so your customers could have an alternative to that thousand dollar jet aeration official pump because these are still official jet branded pumps they're just rebuilt by you economics so best case scenario one of these motors you're gonna you're gonna spend maybe thirty dollars to to get one going again worst case scenario you might spend two hundred dollars and that goes back to what can you sell a rebuilt motor for and then your your time your effort and all the the tools that you're going to need to rebuild one of these is also going to factor into that now me i haven't really bought too much specifically for building these motors this is all tools that i've just always had but most people probably don't have all the tools that i have let's take a look at some of the tools that we're going to need for these so here's my workbench and i have most of the tools i'm going to use sitting on here there might be some other miscellaneous hand tools i'll need to grab but for the most part this is it got hammer drill probably won't need the drill multimeter sprays lubricants this is a bearing splitter you're going to need one you don't want to rely on using a hammer to try to pull bearings you're going to want to use this and a puller, a couple of longer bolts for your puller, a few slugs to push against. And uh, so this is just a little amp meter that I, I threw together. But the, the main reason I need this is because I it's got a circuit breaker. This is It's just an amp meter with a circuit breaker. Extension cord comes in, cut it, runs through the circuit breaker, runs through the amp meter then runs back out. 
the neutrals are just nutted together. But you need to have a circuit breaker. These motors, they pull, this one pulls 4.9 amps. Your typical wall outlet might be a 15 amp breaker over on your box. So if you plug this in, it's going to go up to 15, 20 amps before it trips. That would cook your motor. So you might just, you might ruin your motor if you don't have just a circuit breaker to intercept it. And then the ammeter is just for helping me watch things. You're going to need a socket set. Some Allen's. You really only need one Allen wrench and that's, that's just for taking the set screws out of this collar. And then you're going to need some bolts and stuff. So we're going to be rebuilding a 700LL and I've put together a parts list. Now this, sometimes you open these up and you find things that you don't expect. But for the most part, these are what I expect to find on a 700LL. So you're going to need some O-rings. The O-rings are for the caps. There is an O-ring to seal this from outside elements. So this is the size that I found that, had, that fits. So it's quite a bit of work to figure out which ones fit, so this should be helpful. And then your, your bearings. They typically have the 5203 2RS. You want to make sure it's 2RS. RS means rubber seal. 2 means it's on both sides of the bearing. These take oil seals also, but sometimes you pull them out and they have a different size than this. So that's, maybe it's this kind, maybe it's not. And then they take some metric screws. These go inside the, the end caps and they're for holding the uh, contact switch and the grounding screw in. Now, most people expect these to be uh, imperial or standard, but they're not, they're metric. So you gotta watch for that. And then your bolts, M6 by 1.0, need six of those. Those are for this piece here. Really, if, if you break all these bolts off, I wouldn't even worry about it. I think this thing is just for decoration. It really doesn't do anything. And then your quarter inch by 20 by eight inch. That's these. Those are hard to find. Actually, all these things are hard to find other than your, your quarter inch by 20 nuts, which you use for the bottom of your bolts and the washers. Those you can get at a hardware store, but the rest of these things you're probably not going to find at a hardware store. So I keep mine in this little thing, have it all kind of organized. And most of these, I just, I had to order most of them from Amazon. I know that's, a lot of people don't like to order from Amazon. They want to shop local, but when local doesn't keep the things that you need, sometimes you got to do that. So I just keep mine all organized like this. And you'll need some, some paint. I like to use the red oxide as a primer and then the colors I go with are gray and blue. I think it looks decent to do these in blue and these in gray. And this is three quarter radiator hose. So that's something you can get at a, hard, at a, or at a auto parts store. And you're also going to want to replace this plug. This is probably going to be the most expensive part because this, a watertight plug like this is usually about $20. And it's very rare to find a motor where you can reuse, reuse this plug. And a lot of times, that the only thing really bad with these are water infiltrated this and it corroded everything. I found that a few times. I still rebuild them anyway because I'm not going to trust the old bearings in there. But so yeah, I always replace these. It's there's only been like one instance where I haven't. And that's uh, you're going to want a vise. That'll be helpful. Okay, something that you really need that you're probably not going to have is a blast cabinet with a vacuum system. And I understand that a lot of people aren't going to have this, but I really suggest you get one. It, it would You're going to spend so much time with a wire wheel and sandpaper if you don't have one of these. And if you're planning on rebuilding these motors, there's probably a lot of other things that you can use this for. Like I, I, I blast so many things in, in here. 
it's just a Harbor Freight blast cabinet and I have it full of the, the crushed glass from Harbor Freight. But I've I put uh, cylinder heads in there, blasted them. I put guns in there, blasted them. I, I do so many things in there. So I have a feeling if, if you're planning on doing, rebuilding these kind of motors, you probably also have a lot of things that you could blast in there. Okay, so the, these motor, these motors, I'm gonna, I've decided to rebuild the middle one. This one is actually in really good looking shape. So I don't really want to rebuild that one because that's not really a, a real world scenario. This one is in a little bit rougher shape. The shaft still turns, so that's good, but I'm gonna struggle getting all these bolts out. I'm probably gonna have to cut them all. This one kind of looks like something that you might find like a, a 10 year motor. Set screws still exist. Sometimes you find these and the set screws are just gone. And at that point, you almost need to cut this collar just to get it off. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this one. Okay, your first step, take the aspirator off because otherwise you're gonna break it. Now this is a, a right hand thread, so to remove it, you turn it to the right. A lot of people make that mistake. They sit there and try to turn these to the left like they're opening a pickle jar and they just make it tighter and harder to get off. There, now we don't gotta worry about breaking that. Let's go ahead and take the lifting handle and this air pipe off. This air pipe is an air pipe. So these set down into the ground and then this would draw up fresher air. I think that's, I think that's mostly to deal with uh, in case these get flooded or something, so that way it's pulling air from up there, maybe. I don't know. Now this is one of those pieces that you could easily break. Okay, let's get these set screws out of here. All four of them, we don't want to leave any in there. All the motors that I have sitting in my shop have been sprayed with PB Blaster and they've been sitting for a while like that, so that's gonna help out. You don't want to just spray them real quick and then try to take them out, because you'll probably strip something out. Now that those set screws are out, I always use a torch and heat up the collar. I get it nice and hot, and then I'll spray it with the PB Blaster and then proceed to the next step. One thing I noticed when I was heating up and spinning it is there is a bend in the shaft. So I'll try to straighten it out, but if I can't get it straightened out, then it's going to need a new shaft. And that's going to fall into the uh, category of economics, because what does a new shaft cost? About $70, maybe $100 if you buy an official jet branded shaft. All right, now to get this off, I'm gonna take a cold chisel and I'm gonna put it right against this little collar here. Not on the plastic, but there's a, a steel collar right below that. I'm gonna try, I don't wanna dig it into the shaft, that stainless steel shaft, I wanna get it right like that. Now this is either gonna pull the shaft out of the collar or pull the collar and the shaft off the motor. Either way is fine. All right, I'm pretty sure this shaft is scrapped now. So that was unfortunate about that shaft, but that's uh, kind of what I was saying about Economics, is it economical to rebuild one of these? Probably not. So I'm gonna have to get a new shaft or I'm gonna have to pull a shaft off another motor. But that's that's just part of it. So now we gotta get all these bolts out. These are 10 millimeter, but not promising that the one you're rebuilding is gonna be 10 millimeter, it might be something different. 
and then we'll take this collar off. So you see what I was saying about how I think this piece is just decoration? There is an O-ring there, but it doesn't, there's nothing for it to protect. There's a, a seal inside of this housing that is for that shaft. So I don't, I don't really know what the purpose of that is, but let's get this, this coupler off next. All right, you want to take your bearing splitter, put it on there, get it tightened up. Now you don't want to crank these down. You don't want them to, to dig into your shaft. You just want to be able to pull that off. So we're going to take our metal slug. This is just a three quarter bolt, I think. Drop it down there. Actually, that one's too long. We're going to use this one. Put the oil on the threads. There we go. Okay, let's get all these brackets off of here. We're gonna use a 3-8 socket and a 7 16 wrench. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but all these bolts I take out, I don't reuse them. I mean, these are actually in decent enough shape where they could be reused, but I don't do it. That's why I have all the, the new bolts and screws. I just, I just scrap them and replace them. All right, so we got all these brackets now. And I go ahead and take all this rubber off. All right, so all that is ready for media blasting. are all blasted look pretty good don't they so I'm gonna put some primer on these and for that I'm gonna have to turn on the torpedo here because it's it's about 25 degrees in here and that's a little bit too cold for any kind of painting Okay, so that stuff's all done now. Two coats of primer, two coats of paint. And I like to do it quick like that. In automotive painting, we call that cross-linking. Rather than relying on a purely mechanical bond or like a, a rough surface for the primer to go on, that's a mechanical bond. But putting the, uh, the paint right on the primer while it's still wet, the chemical properties of the paint will cross-link with each other and make a better bond. So that's the theory. And it was probably a little premature to do all that work right away because I don't know if this pump is going to be rebuildable, but if nothing, I, I have a bunch of really nice brackets as spare parts. Okay, let's get this motor apart. First, we want to free up the cord. 
so that way we're not accidentally pulling wires out of anything. Just make sure that can slide freely back and forth. to disconnect all of these. They can be tough. All right, we'll need to get that out. That'll probably have to use a device for that. Okay, when we take this off, we need to be careful of where we rest this like that. Now this is uh, it's a little bit difficult to, to do by myself. I kind of have to, I'm going to hammer out the shaft. I want to knock that out. And I want to be very careful not to drop this on the floor. got my knee under it. Okay, so we can we can see a problem already. This, this bearing has come apart. A couple of the, the ball bearings that are within it are missing. So that's an issue. I, I suppose that maybe the ball bearings fell down into the motor and caused a short or something. I'm not sure. But so we need to take off this switch here. And I'll explain what that switch does. And also there's a grounding lug right there that we need to take that screw out of. Put a PB blaster on everything. I might let that soak for a little bit. And then, um, so for now, let's, uh, let's get this bearing out of here. We'll take that out. Okay, so we're gonna pretty much just knock this bearing out from the backside. Now, when you do this, you wanna watch out for these these uh, bosses right here, because those are just a, a tiny bit higher than the surrounding area. So you want to make sure that you're not resting this end cover on them. You want to turn it so it's kind of like that. I was going to take a piece of rod. Get out. Okay, so we got the bearing and the oil seal out. The oil seal fits into that smaller recess and then the bearing fits into here. So here's what they looked like. And these are the ones that I had on my list too. So that's good, because I have those. All right, we're gonna take a razor blade and we're gonna get this O-ring out of there. piece it's ready for media blasting okay this is the scary part this is where we got to try to get all three of these screws out so make sure you got a sharp screwdriver you put a lot of pressure on it all right we need to get this little zip tie off of there
to pull this terminal off. We can leave this other one. You want to be very careful with this. This switch is about $30. these out. Now I have never had any luck getting these apart. That's a connector and that's a connector and in theory it should pop apart but I've never been able to get them to come apart so I just remove them as is. I'll just take like the, the green out first then the white unthread that another piece in here that a lot of times you'll miss but you want to take this out this one's actually broken but it I think yeah it's pretty worn out I'll need to get a new one of these so what this is it, it, it's supposed to look all warped like that it takes up the space when everything heats up and it expands and contracts that is supposed to take up the space between the, the two there to keep everything a little bit tight. All right, we got this motor all disassembled. I'm just gonna um, show a few more things in here and then I'm, I'm gonna take off and work on this another day. So here is the top piece. Here's the bottom piece. This is called a centrifugal switch. And what it does, I can get this. This is just a piece of the bearing. That. So when you initially start this motor, this piece will start spinning due to an electromagnet field being created in here. And each of these little bars here are being drawn to the fields that are being created. And the, the fields, they go round and round and round. So to initially get the motor started, that's what this is about. This switch right here, it rides on this plastic disc. And in a stop state, it's sitting there activated. And that gives the motor full current. As this, this piece starts spinning, because it needs more current to get it going, as this piece starts spinning, these weights would fling out. And they would pull that plate down so it would break that switch. So that's how that works. So then it wouldn't be getting the full draw or full amperage. Because when you start these, it might jump up to 15 amps and then it'll drop back down to 4.8. And that's because of the switch. In the older days, they used things like capacitors or relays. This is not really a new technology, but it's been kind of the technology that's been getting used for a long time. So that's how that works. And we could do a few things to, uh, to kind of check this. We could use a multimeter and check for continuity between, between these two and between all these. And we could check for ohm resistance and things like that. But truly, right here, we're not able to absolutely check this. One thing that we do want to make sure is that there's not continuity between these are your two hot wires between these and the case. If there is, then this thing is no good. And it would have to be rewound. Rewinding, you can see better from the other side. These windings actually look really good, but one thing that I don't like about how they wind these, so this fat one here is one field. All four of these are connected. And then these other ones, these smaller ones are another field. 
there should be a piece of paper between them, but there's not. I don't really like that. So it's each of these wires is coated in varnish before it's ever wound in there. So right now, all it's depending on is that coating of varnish on each wire to keep this and that from connecting. Don't really like that. And so you can get a motor rewound if, if there is a problem with the windings, but the issue is gonna be to get this motor here rewound, it's probably gonna cost you 300 bucks. Now, like over there on my compressor, I got a big five horsepower motor. It's, it weighs about 300 pounds. Now, to, to get that motor rewound is gonna be about 300 bucks. To get this one rewound is about 300 bucks. It's all in, in the labor. So that's, that's why these typically, if, it, if the windings are bad, you wouldn't rewind it because it would just, it would cost too much money. It's, it's mostly the labor. Because someone has to, there's like a little device, you can search for it on YouTube, that spins all these leads, so you have all the leads already, and then someone has to sit there with like a, a stick and push all, all the leads down through these, each one of these. Each one of these will get a separate lead ran through it, and then there's that paper in there, and then after the lead is pushed in, someone will push that piece of fabric in there, or paper, whatever it is, because all these are isolated from that. So it's very labor intensive. That's why in a, a small motor like this that isn't that valuable, it doesn't make any sense to, to rewind it. But in a bigger motor, a, a five horse, a 10 horse, really big motors, it makes more sense to rewind it because it's all in the labor. You know, this, this motor, what, what is this motor really worth? I mean, I know if you bought one from Jet, it's $1,000, but I'm looking at it and I, I think it's, hundred dollar motor that's my opinion on it so but all, all this it really all looks good and I already checked the switch for continuity the switch is working I am gonna blast it because it has corrosion on there and I already checked those for continuity too and everything checked out good but that doesn't mean I'm not gonna rebuild this whole thing plug in and it's still not gonna work because I'm not able to to fully test that, to fully test it, you would need a lot more sophisticated equipment. You'd have to energize these, and I think you use an oscilloscope to check the waveforms and everything in there. I'm not an electrical engineer, so I don't exactly know. And then these two caps, I'm gonna fully, fully blast them in the cabinet. I'm gonna blast the inside, I'm gonna blast these races, all that, because it's okay, this doesn't need to be a super tight fit. Those bearings are actually supposed to be able to move I really shouldn't have had to beat it apart, but they all seem to be that way. Those bearings are supposed to be a, a slip fit in there. So I'm going to blast these inside and out and make sure to get in that channel. But right now I'm going to go home because it's, it's cold and I'm kind of tired. Before I get too far ahead on blasting everything, I want to, I want to address all the, the grease and grime and whatever is in here. This is supposed to be a hollow tube, and that's where the, the air comes through. And I find that every one of these that I take apart, this tube is always blocked up with crud. So I want to clean that out. Use a 3 8 dowel rod, and I'll just uh, use some pieces of paper towel to push through there. Okay, so I'm going to use some, some cleaner. Just kind of like, like cleaning a gun barrel. So I am going to blast on this. I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm just going to do from where the bearing stops up. Same on this end. I'll do from there up. I'm not going to not going to blast down here or anything. It's just that's just all I'm going to do for that. And as I'm blasting, I'm also going to pull that away so that way I'm not bombarding this plastic piece with grit.
be careful not to touch any of the, the wires with this wheel. You don't want to strip any varnish off of that. Stuff it up with a red scotch bright pad. I'm going to sand the inside with some 120 grit by hand. You just want to make sure it's nice and smooth for your o-ring to slide in. You don't want to damage that o-ring trying to put it in because then uh, it'll have a lot less water resistance. Okay, we're going to want to clean this up and I'm going to mask off the label here. And to clean it, I just use, this is just 50% rubbing alcohol and 50% distilled water. It's a, basically a waterborne wax and grease remover. It's all I ever really use when painting anymore. I don't really use solvents for cleaning. We don't want to get paint in these bearing areas, so we're going to mask them off. This is just an old broken piece from a motor that I'm setting that on. And when you spray this, you, you don't want to get a ton of paint in there. A little bit's okay, but you know, try not to spray in there, just spray from the side. Okay, now we're going to push the bearings under the shaft. These are the uh, 5203 2RS bearings go under this, two of them. Now sometimes when you disassemble this there will be like a shim between the this um, snap ring or retaining ring and the bearing. This one didn't have any, but if yours had a shim or a washer between the two you might as well put it back in there. There's probably a reason for that. So to push these on, we're going to use a 5.8 socket to start it, and then we'll use this pipe for, for this longer one. I'll be able to use the socket all the way on this one. But you want to make sure that whatever you're putting on there, it's only pushing against the center part. You don't want to push against that rubber seal or the exterior of the bearing. You want to make sure you push just the center part. So for this, I am going to use a hammer. I could go over and use my press, but not everyone has a press, so you can do it this way too. And, and you want this to be sitting on like a piece of wood so you don't damage the shaft. You just want to get it up to that clip. You don't want to just keep pounding it because you could break that clip off and then you got more issues. You, got, you would have to take this bearing back off. One more thing I want to do before I go. Um, since this is all bare metal, it's not getting painted. I like to, to spray it with some dry lube, with this Teflon, to act as a rust inhibitor. Okay, we're gonna drive this oil seal into there. That was the 16, 16 by 28 by seven that's the seal that this one takes sometimes they take a bigger one I'm just gonna kind of watch for that now you're gonna want to use like a, a socket that'll fit right into that I also like to use a washer just to press it down first to help keep it square. 
because you put the socket on there it's gonna want to do that so I'll use the, the washer first to seat it and use the socket to get it the rest of the way down we'll go ahead and put our o-rings on now little bit of dielectric grease on the o-rings and we'll go ahead and set this on there too you just want to try to keep your label between the the ears I do is I, I would put this in through the top but this needs to go out the bottom of the motor and normally I put it over in my vise and I kind of have paper towels in the vise but what I'm going to do I'm just going to drill a hole right through my workbench and then this will pass right through it and then the motor can just sit right here that will be kind of nice I hate to drill a hole in my workbench but it's for a good cause take that off it just kind of worked out that way this time I want to be careful with it don't want to mess this thing up This, this ground attached first and I didn't mention earlier but all these screws that I buy none of them are stainless well the only thing that I would get in stainless would be like the allen screw for the, the coupler because if you've ever worked with stainless bolts you've probably had a lot of them break off because they tend to, to seize up in whatever metal you're putting in them in because stainless is a lot harder typically than whatever you're putting into unless it's another piece of stainless so if you tighten it a little bit too much it's going to deform the metal that you're putting into and seize up and then when you break it off it's hard as hell to get out so i really don't recommend using stainless steel for for many of these things and remember these are these are metric screws too attach this to here Also, I, I blew out all these holes really good with uh, compressed air. Otherwise, you would end up with glass in there and it'd be really tough to get these screws in. What is it? reconnected I remember there was some some zip ties in there you want to you want to get some zip ties back in there keep everything together
I think there was only one, but I'm gonna put put more than that in. Okay, remember this piece, it was broken when I took it out, so I've got another one. Maybe I could, maybe I could just set it there if I don't bump it. You gotta watch where these wires go because you don't want them to catch against anything. grabbing or anything in there. I think it's safe. Okay. Put a lock washer on there. tight because the original ones were eight and a quarter and I have been unable to find any eight and a quarter bolts. I can only find eight inch and nine inch. Just snug it a little bit. You want to get them all started before you crank anything down. Well you don't want to crank anything down. You want to just get it tight. season these bolts though because of the nature of what's going to be getting on them all right let's make some insulators for all the brackets about an inch or so long this is three quarter inch Pose. All right, we got all these, so let's get them on there. All right, we're close, but still got to replace the plug on it. This is a Eaton Arrow Heart. I don't know what that means. I just know that this is what works. So this, it comes with a few different seals. Okay, so this, it comes with a few different seals for different size wire. This particular case, we use the blue one. First, we want to put um, this plus this nylon washer. We're going to put that on first. And then we're going to put this blue seal, and that goes this direction because this will fit down into that cone. This piece and now we can strip and attach our plug I'm not going to show that because that's there's other videos for stuff like that okay before we plug this in we want to make sure there's not continuity between the ground and the plugs okay double check up on the, the motor too No 
Okay, this thing is ready to be plugged in and tested out. All right, here we go. I put my gloves on for a little bit of protection in case it starts shooting the sparks out. Let's see what happens. It's running right at 4.9 amps. I don't know if the camera picked it up, but you could see it jump up. That was um, before that centrifugal switch would have activated and taken it back down. So that's a rebuilt motor, and I'm gonna put the, the coupler on and everything, but I'm gonna have to sand out the inside to make it a better fit. And then as for the shaft, I'll have to get another shaft for it. I might have to buy one, because probably most of the shafts that I got are bad. So that's, that's usually what happens with these things. The shafts get all wrapped in um, roots and hair, and they, they start to cut grooves into them, and they get weak and they bend, and then it takes out the bearings. So, that's it though, that's the end. You ready to go home? Huh? You ready to go home? Yeah? Next day, I gotta add this in here. So, I was cleaning up my workbench, I got that all done, I plugged this in, and the amp shot up to 20 and held there and blew the circuit breaker. So then I, I checked this and I had hot to ground. So something was wrong and it's running now i took it all apart it's a whole lot quieter isn't it so i took it apart and what i found was you remember how i was having all that trouble getting those when i was twisting the cap trying to get the wires just right well i didn't have them right so that contactor switch in there when the weights flung out it must have grabbed one of the wires ripped it out and it was touching the case and it must have been rubbing on it too because it's so much quieter now so I fixed that. I zip tied the wires down to the uh, down to the fields, so there's no chance of that happening again. And now it's it's good to go. It's completely finished this time. So that's officially the end.